Alrighty. Here we go. Hey everyone, welcome to our Action Under the Dome legislative session wrap up. Um, we'll be getting started in just a minute or two. I see folks still still trickling in, um, but we're really excited to have you with us today to wrap up. I would say the session that was, but it is the <laughs> session that is, um, as we will discuss. But um, we we know where most of the legislative work of interest that we've been following has gone. I think we can sort of tell a story of the session at this point. Um, so we wanted to take some time today to let you all know, you know, how things went, what we're looking forward to in the future and what we're doing in the meantime to get there. So we'll give it again, just another minute or two and then we will jump right in. All right. Well, let's let's go ahead and get get rolling here. Um first off, just a couple of introductions. Um my name is Will Hayward, and I am the Advocacy Program Director for Democracy Maine and the League of Women Voters of Maine. Um, and I am sort of the staff lead on a lot of our advocacy work at the legislature and otherwise. Um, and so I try to, you know, rally our membership to support our issues, um, get the legislature on board, pass good policy, make sure good policy comes into comes into place. Um, and I couldn't do that, any of that without my co-presenter, Ann Luther. Ann, do you want to say a few words? I am the volunteer leader where uh, Will is the professional. I'm the, I don't know what you call amateur. And uh, I chair the advocacy team, have done for a long time. And um, I don't know, we're a team. We work together and um, we've got a great group of people. And Will's going to tell about all the wonderful work we were able to do this year. So. Absolutely. And so we have an agenda here that um, that I will cover in a second, but I'll just say that at any point, if anyone has questions, feel free to put them right into the Q&A box in the chat and we will um, try to take them as as we're able as we go. Um, you know, we always want these to be pretty informal, open conversation, all of that. And we love talking about this stuff. So I really welcome any of your questions. Um, so today we're going to cover a sort of, you know, broad look back and look forward at the um, legislative work that went on this year. Um, we'll cover what we as the League of Women Voters of Maine did. We'll talk about sort of the overview of what was the story of the whole legislature and then what was the story of democracy issues in the legislature. And then we'll talk about some specific bills and how they went this year. Um, and then we'll, we'll take some time to look ahead. We'll talk about what either came up this year and was put off until next year, what we expect to come up next year. And then we'll talk a, a bit about some of the work that we're going to be doing in the meantime and places that anyone on this call is uh, welcome to join us and help us do that work as we get to next year's session. All right, well, let's go ahead and jump in then. Um, so what did we do this session? Um, we did a lot. I, I was tallying up the bills that we testified on the other day and we testified on over 60 bills um, in either written, in person or over Zoom. Um, and, you know, that was a mix of staff like me volunteers um and you know sometimes a mix on the same bill i would write testimony and a volunteer would deliver a volunteer would write testimony i would deliver um it was really a team effort and i really felt like we made our voice heard on so many democracy issues um so that's something i'm really proud of just the high number of times we participated so directly in the process like that and we followed another 60 bills that we didn't testify on, you know, things that we didn't have a position on, but 
we're interested um, possibly for the future. So it was a pretty good sized, high quality portfolio this year. Yeah, definitely. And as you know, as folks probably know, um, there are over 2000 bills that come to the legislature and every bill just about ends up getting a hearing. So um, there's a lot we end up following and a lot, sometimes things we've never thought about before. And we have to, you know, figure out if we're going to respond, try to educate ourselves and keep doing this work. Um, there were several bills that we led on and uh, I will discuss these more later on. But that's to say that we were, you know, working on the issue from the very start. In some cases, we came up with either the policy that we wanted to see advance in the legislature or even, you know, came up with draft legislative language we wanted to see. Um, you know, then we worked with legislators to help get that put in, help advocate for it, and in some cases, get its passage. Um, and then we had our advocacy day and other times we spoke um, with legislators. Do you want to talk a little bit about advocacy day, Anne? Oh, it was great. You know, quite a few people, volunteers and staff showed up at the state house and we had a briefing on our high priority bills. And many of our volunteers who came um, were able to speak directly to their legislators about our priorities and some really high quality conversations with with our legislators. I mean, we're, we're lucky in Maine that most of us know who our legislators are, but building these relationships is um, really so helpful on the priority bills that we were talking about that day, but on a continuing basis. So it was really, really a great day. Um, and I forget how many people came. How it many was close to, close to 50 people showed up. Which is fantastic, right? Yep. Yeah. So that, that was so great and we had several other times when folks came up to you know there was some of the wabanaki alliance rallies we brought people to those um some of the work around the protect main elections foreign government uh, banning foreign government spending bill that i'll talk about later on so we had lots of opportunities to go up and connect directly with legislators and on top of that, we had over 1,300 contacts to legislators through our various, you know, take actions, call for call for actions on some of our priorities. Um, we'll talk about some of those specifically later on, but I can say definitively, um, based on how some things progressed, even if we didn't have a positive outcome, like we can say very confidently, we made our voices heard, and it changed the outcome um, in some way, and so. We'll talk a bit more about that, but we we really um, you know made our voices heard this year, and that was a really exciting thing we did. Um, and then finally, under this and much more, I just want to recognize all of the work that all of our volunteers and staff did in making all of this happen. You know, the weekly emails we send out every every week, updating on the legislature, the deciding on policy positions, all of that. It's, you can't capture it in numbers the same way, but it's just really incredible work that I'm so proud of our team for. And I think, you know, you and I here today will kind of, um, I don't know, dem demonstrate, because I think part of our strength is that we are not purely a professional organization. We're, um, you know, we have staff and we have very talented and professional staff, but we also have very high performing volunteers. and. And um, that mix is very powerful. Like when uh, somebody stands up in front of a public hearing and says, I'm a volunteer for the League of Women Voters, and then delivers very well researched and uh, confident testimony, it's really good. And it carries a lot of weight with that committee. It, it's not to say that legislators don't look to Will, you know, he, he's the guy that's there all the time and if they have a question it's him but you know when we can bring people to those public hearings who are only in it for the passion not to say you not, are not passionate about this will because i know you are but um you know that it's re really brings a lot of credibility to our work absolutely that's very well said um so this is just an overview of what we did and you know we're going to get to what we did all of this on but first, I want to just kind of take the broadest view possible and look at, you know, just an overview of the legislature as a whole um, from where we sit, how how we see how it went. Um, 
And so there's just a few, um, a few key points I want to hit on that affected sort of all areas of the legislative process. It's certainly not just our, you know, our pieces of legislation that we we worked on. But um, when I think back on this session, this first bullet point is going to be the one that I remember most <laughs> clearly. It was very, very long. It is very, very long. Um, so as you know, as folks may know, the first regular session of the legislature technically adjourned back in March um, so that a majority budget could be passed passed in time um, to prevent a government shutdown. And as a result of that, they didn't have the stat, they don't have the statutory date that's set out um, that they have to end by that they normally would in mid-June. And partially as a result of that, partially as a result of the fact that it just took a really long time for a lot of bills to come out. Um, and a lot of major bills, you know, didn't come out till quite late in the legislative session. Um, things really dragged on. You know, we, a lot of the major votes were happening the final week of June. The budget wasn't, the like final budget wasn't voted on until early July. They just did the fiscal table, uh, the appropriations table last week. And then next week is going to hopefully be their final day. And I mean, there were lots of contributing factors to this. You know, partisanship is certainly part of it. Um, you know, the re revisor's office seemed to be operating under some different ground rules than they have before. And the revisor's office is the one that actually has to draft the statutory language. All the printed bills have to come through the revisor's office. And as Will said, some of them didn't come out till very late. Um, before they used to consolidate all the identical bills, but this year every one of those got their own title, so that kind of slowed things down. And then it just seemed like the committees were working kind of slow too. It seemed like there was, I don't know, a sort of a lack of unanimity and a lack of interest in expediting the work. So sometimes it looked like there were minority reports, one and two and three way minority reports that were just for the purpose of gumming up the works. I mean, I'm not accusing anybody of anything, but it was a very long committee process as well, which resulted in what, you know, Will is saying, there were a lot of bills I didn't get to. A lot more bills carried over than I think we've seen in prior years. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, and we'll talk about this, but there's definitely some, priority legislation of ours that um, won't be considered until next year. There were bills of ours that were considered on the very last day of committee and they actually voted on and then realized they were moving too quickly and moved <laughs> them to next year. Um, we'll get to that, but that was not, again, not just unique to us, but um, a couple final observations here I would offer are, you know, there's definitely this like spirit of collaboration that everyone comes into the start of the legislation legislative session with, um, you know, all the good vibes and all of that. And those sure evaporated over time, not surprising, you know, a long session, you start to get major issues with votes that very much go on party lines. And then, you know, the moods start to sour. Um, and we definitely saw that this year. Um, and I think we also saw I would say, you know, some upsides and some hiccups to coming back fully in person. I still feel like I don't fully have my head around, like, did that, you know, how did that affect the work product that came out of this at the end? But we know we saw and we heard about legislators, you know, shouting at each other in the hall, each other in the halls, having to deal with, you know, just people being there all the time. And, um, you know, I think that affected affected people's moods, perhaps their votes, perhaps their ability to work together over time. But there's also, you know, a lot of benefit in terms of getting to know each other that resulted as well. All right, so that's sort of some broad strokes of the legislature as a whole. But what about democracy in the 131st <laughs> legislature? Um, there was the, you know, we worked on several issue areas. Folks are probably familiar with some of the issue areas that we worked on. Um, you know, of course, we have our core voting rights um, agenda. You know, we have our money and politics work, some of the structural reform issues, you know, like ranked choice voting, primaries, um, 
of national popular vote. Um, and then, of course, we've expanded our work on some racial justice and equity issues, including, um, you know, the work that great work that the Wabanaki Alliance is doing. Um, we've been very supportive of that, as well as trying to think of other areas where um, we can get involved. And each of those areas kind of has a story story to tell. Um, and so I guess I'll just start by saying that, you know, one very positive headline is that, you know, the work around protecting and expanding voting rights, I think, went very well this year. I think that there was a very strong commitment we saw from the legislature to protecting voting rights, expanding them. You know, we saw some bills that were frightening this year, you know, bills to ban drop boxes altogether, bills to, you know, require photo ID and, you know, do things like specifically exclude college ID. So, you know, some of the very targeted things that we've seen become law in other states. Um, Bills to require people to re-register every four years. That was the right. Winner. Right. And so, you know, the, these things came up and when they did come up, you know, our members, our coalition partners would show up. We would testify against them. We would make sure the narrative wasn't, you know, this is some popular thing. And we were successful in defeating these, you know, efforts to restrict the vote, um, which I think, you know, I think we're getting used to taking for granted here. And we really, really shouldn't because these things can change on a dime. And we see what's happening across so much of the country. So I think there was, you know, fantastic defensive work to sort of, you know, not only combat the policy, but combat the lies behind the policies. Um, that I was very, very proud of everyone, both, you know, in the advocacy community and also in the legislature itself who stood up to push back against that. And then, you know, we expanded voting rights. Um, I'll talk a little bit more about it, but we passed ongoing absentee voting expanded so that everyone will be eligible to get on the list to be, you know, sent an absentee ballot automatically if they so desire. Um, really excited about that. We saw additional resources go to the Secretary of State's office to help them more efficiently run elections. We improved our automatic voter registration system. Really just, you know, voting rights, I think, unambiguously a positive story to be told this year. Um, well, let's let's turn to an area that was perhaps a little less positive. And if you want to talk about Talk about how some of the money and politics Ugh. work went this year, because this was certainly an area that was less unambiguous. Fraught. The money and politics work is fraught. Um, we worked really hard last year to pass a corporate contribution ban where corporations could not give directly to candidates or to candidate-led leadership packs. And um, that, that, you know, just a lot of things went wrong. There's plenty of blame about how this went wrong. Um, you know, the Eth Ethics Commission played a hand, we played a hand, our national partners played a hand, our in-state partners played a hand. Lots of ways this went wrong, but it does illustrate the complexity of money and politics reform at this particular moment in time, because the it's a little bit of a wild west out there, and every thread you pull unravels another thread. And... I mean, there's just a deep and abiding sense, even among some of our friends, that it takes money to win. And so we lost the corporate contribution ban, which we worked really hard on last year and which was our signature bill and a big win for us last year. You know, we hope that we're going to be able to bring it back next year. And one of the incidents that we'll talk about where our voices were heard and the legislature acknowledged that. I mean, they knew that this was not a popular move, repealing the corporate contribution ban. So they did give us a chance to revisit the issue um, in the second session. And we will certainly take advantage of that that opportunity. But it was a tough loss. Mm -hmm. Well, I'll... To make the picture a little more ambiguous, I will highlight some of the money and politics work that I thought was positive. Um, yes. You know, we did we did pass a bill that I'll talk about a little more late, late, later to enhance um, disclosure in municipal referendums, some of which have no disclosure requirements at all right now, and that will change after this legislative session. Um, 
And then there were some bills of ours that I think, and these are the bills I referred to, some of the bills I referred to earlier that got carried over to next year. I think I would say that the conversation around them in the legislative committee um, was much more robust than I expected, a lot more interest in working on some areas of campaign finance reform that I thought might seem like long shots. Um, and so, you know, I think there are signs of hope. I think there's, I think that a lot of people are trying to find common ground on this. Um, but again, you know, losing the corporate contribution ban was a very painful, painful blow, just <laughs> to put it frankly. Yep. Um, you know, and I, I would highlight next here just the sort of the historic progress on Wabanaki issues. You know, folks are probably well aware that LD 2004, which would have included the Wabanaki and federal beneficial laws, that that was vetoed, which was a real, real shame to see. Um, and the veto was not able to be overridden. But there was, you know, I would still highlight the history of, you know, the original vote on it got 100 votes in support, which was incredible. Um, you know, they had the State of the Tribes address, I think, in March, um, which was another just, you know, historic sort of, I think, moment of recognition and, you know, an effort to um, right historic wrongs. Um, and there's still so much work to be done here. Um, there were several other pieces of legislation that we supported that we weren't, you know, intimately involved in, but that we supported, such as, you know, the constitutional amendment to print um, print the tribal treaty obligations in our constitution, which that bill is well on its way to advancing and getting to the ballot. And then we will see um, the tribal sovereignty bill come up next year. Um, so definitely some history made on on that. And then the structural changes, ranked choice voting for governor. Uh, we did not get that. It's still gridlocked. And um, the national popular vote which we are also ma making a very high priority got carried over, which we'll talk about a little bit more later, but there was no significant progress on those structural changes this year, maybe next year. Yep, uh, we, will, we will see and we'll, we'll talk about what some of those are specifically. And there's a, a question I see here about the foreign government contributions bill, which I will address shortly. Um, yeah. <laughs> that is we're, like, we're watching the clock here we're just looking this, back and forth I'll, I'll explain the whole story here but we really are watching by the minute <laughs> to find out if this bill is getting vetoed or not um but i want to refer back to first and we've already touched on a lot of these but this is just four of everything here except the corporate contribution ban were these were the four thing the other four on here were the bills we came into the session and we said these are priorities for us on our advocacy day, those were the bills that we went and talked to our legislators about. We didn't know the corporate contribution ban was gonna get repealed yet at that point, or I'm sure we would have put that on the list too. But um, just to quickly run through our highest priority legislation we came into the session with, as I mentioned, the ongoing absentee voting bill, which expanded eligibility for ongoing absentee voting from voters 65 and older and voters with disabilities to all voters being eligible for it. Um, that became law without the governor's signature, which I'm still a little perplexed by. Um, but, you know, that happens sometimes. <laughs> Things become law and the governor doesn't sign them. But if the legislature is still in and she doesn't act, they automatically become law. Um, but either way, that is law now. Um, it will not go into effect until the beginning of 2026. The Secretary of State's office is doing a lot of work I would say sort of staggering in reforms. We're gonna get online voter registration um, starting at the beginning of next year. We're gonna get the limited ongoing absentee voting. We're gonna get a new um, you know, system for them to use for all of this. And so after all of that, we will get this expansion that we're excited about. Um, you I'm know. gonna close the door, parking okay. dog. Be okay. Right <laughs> um, so, you know, and as we discussed, the corporate contribution ban was repealed, which, you know, did become one of our priorities once it became clear that was happening, which I would say was not until the very end of the sort of the committee process there. Um, and I'll, I'll take a moment now to discuss the foreign government election spending. Um, so folks are probably aware of this. This was the, um, it started as legislation last 
last session, the 130th, um, that was vetoed by the governor. And then it came back as a ballot, um, a ballot referendum. Um, you know, signatures were gathered. It got enough signatures to qualify for the ballot. And anything that qualifies for the ballot first goes to the legislature, and the legislature can pass it outright. Um, if they don't, then it goes to the ballot, which is what happens in most, but not all cases. But sometimes the legislature does pass pass bills, and you know this bill bans foreign governments and foreign government owned entities from spending in in referendum elections in Maine. They're already banned from spending in any candidate elections, and that's you know nationwide. But referendums are still this big loophole we see to be closed. So um, you know. We know that this is an incredibly popular issue, like voters just uniformly, and I'm not even exaggerating, I'm talking like 80, 90% of voters agree that this should be banned. Um, and so we asked the legislature to pass it outright, as I described before. Um, it got through both chambers after a long and tortured history of involving going to the <laughs> Supreme Judicial Court. I, I won't, won't bore you all with that history, but in short, we figured out that it was, you know, something that could move ahead in the legislature. And so it completed that process um, 12 days ago. And so after, you know, after a bill um, passes both chambers, um, finally, it goes to the governor, and th this includes referendum questions, and the governor can um, can you know veto, sign, or let it go into law without a signature after 10 days, excluding Sundays, so 12 days. And so as I mentioned, today is the 12th day, and um, one might assume we would know by 5 p.m., but that is not the actual deadline for a veto to be issued or not. It's midnight, of course. Um, so I can say we do have people in the state house who are watching to see if the governor vetoes this or if she, I think what's most likely if she doesn't veto it is she lets it go into law without her signature. Um, but we will know after today. And if she does veto it, then you know first it goes back to the legislature for them to attempt to override that veto. And if they fail that, we still have the backstop of you know, what most people think of with referendums, it going to ballot, ballot and being voted on in November. So if either of those things play out, um, then we will certainly have, you know, ways to mobilize people, work to do to make sure that this um, does eventually become law, because I very strongly believe it will, but we just have to keep doing the work if it doesn't become law today um, with the governor not vetoing it. It's a very <laughs> up to the minute moment situation <laughs> we're in on this one. <laughs> um, and then so the other two on here, as we mentioned, you know, the national popular vote, um, which, you know, I'm sure folks are familiar with this, but it's the proposal to ensure that um, the president is elected by the popular vote, whoever gets the most votes for president across all 50 states in DC is elected president. And that's a state by state thing for each state to join. And the goal is to get to a majority of the electoral college into it, 270. Um, this was one we thought might come up this year because we knew that the bill had been put in, but the we just heard from the legislature there was an appetite to take it up next year. Um, so this one, um, this one will be back um, next year, and we will, you know, be doing all the education and, you know, rallying people around this. Until then, um, I'm feeling a little more wind in my sails on this, frankly, because it passed in Minnesota about a month ago, and that's another. I should know how many electoral votes. I want to say twelve electoral votes, something like that, moving in the right direction. So we hope that Maine can help help advance that even further next year. And then finally, as I mentioned, the tribal sovereignty bill was carried over. Um, and so that will be another big push next year. We'll be looking to the Wabanaki Alliance's leadership on, you know, how we can be most supportive. But in the past, some of the work we've done that I think has been the most impressive has been around presenting educational materials to the public, you know, making people more aware of this issue. Um, and I'm really hopeful that we can keep doing that until then. Um, all right, so let's move along then to um, 
there's a whole bunch of other legislation here and I don't I don't want to <laughs> put you to sleep, but I do want to talk about some of these bills that were very exciting. You see things that became law, things that didn't. Um, and do you want to start us off on this and just talk about a, a couple of the things here? Well, the municipal campaign transparency one is one that Will alluded to earlier. It's where our towns who, mostly smaller towns who don't have their own charter, like if you're a charter town, you can make your own rules, but non-charter towns abide by state law. And for non-charter towns, there was no requirement that um, there be any spending disclosure for um, initiative campaigns in those towns. And there are some hot issues circulating in some of those towns, you know, things to do with, well, I mean, Bar Harbor has, is a charter town, but cruise ships, that was a ballot initiative up there. Um, some broadband initiatives are circulating around there, a bunch of them. And um, some of these have some big spending and nobody knows, you know, who it is. So this was a priority for us to require that spenders in those initiative campaigns in smaller towns over a certain limit um, have to disclose. And we we did that. Uh, we, we put the bill together. We got a sponsor. We ran the legislative campaign and it passed. It was really great. Yeah, that was I think that was just a really enjoyable one to work on too. We had, you know, we had our version of the bill and then two other legislators had put in their own versions just like because a bunch of people were seeing that this is a problem. And, you know, they they were supportive of passing this however we could. And so they withdrew theirs and got behind ours, um, you know, passed in the House without a vote. And then in the Senate, you know, the morning that they voted on it, they, they told me, we're going to do a roll call on this. We really like this one. And I always get nervous when you open anything up to a roll call because it's like, OK, now it's not now it's not guaranteed. But <laughs> it passed by a 31 to four vote in the Senate, which was really awesome. You don't you don't see votes like that on campaign finance um, legislation. So that was just really thrilling. Um, and this next one is one that Will did almost sing single handed. I mean, he had the league support, but he made the case for it. He worked with national partners. He worked with the speaker and he got this thing passed. It was good. Yeah, this is one I I. I, I won't do my own horn, but I'm, I'm oh, pretty, proud, <laughs> pretty proud of the work on this. Um, so this was around prison gerrymandering, which is the issue where um, when, you know, when you're doing drawing districts for redistricting, people who are incarcerated are counted where the correctional facility, where the prison is, um, not where they lived before, you know, in Maine. Um, people who are incarcerated are still eligible to vote, but only at the address they lived at prior. So it creates this sort of imbalance of, um, you know, of how districts are drawn. You get these districts that have like, in the example of Warren, like a thousand plus people there who cannot vote there. They vote somewhere else. So the representation just gets a bit out of whack. Um, it's called prison gerrymandering broadly in Maine. I, I think I didn't use that term as much in the legislature because I don't think it has quite the crazy disproportionate effects it has some places. But, you know, talking to national experts coming out of the last redistricting cycle and going into the legislature this year, they told me, you know, a state like Maine passing this would be really, you know, symbolically important because we are one of the few states that allows incarcerated people to um, to vote. Um, in, in some other states, it is I won't say done intentionally, but it is more like gerrymandering because right. big, big state prisons and, um, you know, get situated in rural areas and increase the representation in rural areas where almost everybody who's incarcerated comes from an urban area and decreases representation in urban areas. So it definitely has a gerrymandering impact when it's done on a large scale. I mean, I don't think that was Maine pro Maine's particular problem, but it wasn't fair, right. and it's yeah. good to have it changed. Yeah, and I'll just say, you know, both of the leg legislators who represent both um, both the Warren State Prison and um, the facilities in Wyndham signed on to this bill. They recognized, like, oh, this is like a weird thing in my district that we should fix. Um, and so it had a kind of tortured legislative path. Um, you know, it it passed out of committee twelve to one, which was great. Passed in the House without a vote, which was great. And then it got voted down in the Senate. 
which was strange. And then we did a little bit of outreach and education to senators urging them to reconsider. It came back to the Senate and it passed with almost everyone on both sides voting differently than they had the first time. So very strange, but it did get signed into law. And you know, now when we do our next redistricting in 2031, um, you know, we will use this process, which I think is, you know, just a simple issue of, you know, fairness and representation. Um, and one of the hopes in talking to national experts is that the census will actually change their policies so that everyone is doing this. And I saw we got a comment in the chat expressing hope that, that would be the case. And, you know, that is exactly the aim that people have. And, you know, I think that this, this helps with that. So very excited about that one. Um, so I'll, I'll run through a few, some of these other ones a little more, more quickly, but, um, you know, I, I discussed earlier the bill around a constitutional amendment so that the tribal treaty, treaty obligations that are in our constitution, but are not printed so that those are printed again. Um, and this was a bill that, you know, the Wabanaki Alliance championed, and it is, I think, you know, it's symbolic, but it's important, you know, symbolism, um, to not erase that history. And so this is a constitutional amendment. So it needed two thirds in the legislature and it's gotten two thirds in the house. Um, and so then it went to the appropriations table. It came off the appropriations table. It will be voted on in the Senate um, next Tuesday when they're back in for their final day. I don't anticipate any issues at all with this. Um, and with constitutional amendments, once they've passed both chambers, then they go straight to the ballot. The governor doesn't have a role in this. Um, so after next Tuesday, we will know that this will be on the November ballot. And you know we will be doing the work as we do on all issues on the ballot to educate people on what it's about and what it means. Um, I'll just quickly mention a couple here that were carried over in the sort of money and politics world. Um, and uh, so the first was a bill to expand our clean elections program that allows people to, you know, run for office without having to raise big outside dollars um, to expand that to some county offices. Um, and this is definitely a, you know, I think a new concept to come before the legislature. Um, we had all sorts of offices we've been thinking about, but the ones that we really honed in on that we have seen a lot of money are district attorney and sheriff and to a lesser extent, maybe county commissioners. Um, and so there was a lot of interest from the committee, the Veterans and Legal Affairs Committee, who this bill went to. There was a lot of interest, but this was that bill that came to the committee on the very final day of committee work and they voted then realized they should have spent more time thinking about it because um, we have a lot of you know program design questions I would say around it but um, it is something that is going to be taken up in that committee next year we're committed to continuing the work on it. And I think they thought it was a good idea like we do I mean like the district attorney it's kind of expensive to run for district attorney and they they, it, they either raise money from lawyers which is not such a good idea if you're going to be the district attorney or they have to be um, well enough situated personally to be able to self-fund their campaign. And neither one of those is really that good for democracy. So I think people saw that it was a good idea, but it, this was one of those where the devil's in the details and they wanted a couple more um, bites at the apple to see if they could um, wrestle down some of those fine points. The true disclosure one was, um, you know, it's about since Citizens United, this vast network of interlocking corporations has arisen where a donor over here gives to a nonprofit over there, which gives to a PAC over here. And it, by the time it gets to actually be spent in Maine, you can't tell where the heck that money came from. So this true source disclosure was also just you have to name a name that was an actual person that originated or a corporation, whatever, that originated the money. And everybody seems to think it's a good idea. But again, the devil's in the details. And um, they felt, and I don't blame them because we really wrestled with this internally too, um, they need a little bit more time to figure out exactly how this is going to work. Mm -hmm. And so just to highlight a couple others that look like they, well, the next one did not get over the finish line. Um, 
is paid time off to vote. And this is a, um, you know, a concept we've seen in other states. 28 states have some form of time off to vote, whether that's paid or unpaid. Um, strategically, I would do this bill differently next time. Um, it sort of got lumped in with a bill to do make election day a holiday and different groups had different oppositions to each of those concepts. And we're like, I would say sort of lukewarm on election day as a holiday, because if you make it a state holiday, the only people who get that off are state workers generally. Um, and it doesn't do what people want it to do. But nonetheless, you know, different groups had different concerns about different parts of this. The business community had opposition to the paid time off to vote component. And so the committee that that went to state and local government voted it down. Um, but we may work on that in a future session. Um, and then finally, the ranked choice voting constitutional amendment. Um, so we want ranked choice voting. I'll say it very clearly. We want it for governor in general elections, and we want it for the state legislature in general elections. And folks know that there's the constitutional issue that the um, the Supreme Judicial Court has identified as not as preventing it from being um, being implemented without a constitutional amendment. The problem is. A constitutional amendment, as we've discussed, needs two thirds. And, you know, right now, ranked choice voting in Maine is just seen as a very partisan issue. Unfortunately, you know, we, we don't see it that way. But the vote in both chambers went essentially purely on party lines. Um, so it's not technically dead yet, but we don't have any expectation it'll get the two thirds it needs. So we need to continue the work and hope that that changes over time. But it's just an unfortunate current reality. And and the question in the um, the Q and A, what is the opposition to ranked choice voting for governor? I mean, it's alas among the minority party, and um, they have um, constructed a narrative that Bruce Poliquin lost his congressional bid because of ranked choice voting. That is not true. That is not why he lost. He would have lost anyway. But that's the narrative that has prevailed, and it prevents. Um, Republicans from get, from getting behind this. And, you know, it's either going to take some different constitutional interpretation or it's going to take Republicans having um, lost an election because they didn't have ranked choice voting to bring some people around on that. This, you know, we're, we're in this stuff for the long haul. This We're not the flash in the pan type organization. We worked on some of this stuff for 20 or 30 years. So we're not giving up on this, but we've got a ways to go. Yeah. And if you want to look optimistically, I will say the one little bit of optimism around this was there was a bill to repeal ranked choice voting, um, you know, to take it away from the places we do, we currently have it. And those barely had bipartisan support, but there were people from both parties who voted, um, voted, you know, voted to defeat that bill. So I'm looking at that as the first tiny window, but there's a lot more work to do. Um, and I already discussed some of these bad bills that were defeated, so I don't think we need to spend any more time on them. But just to say that, you know, some of them were defeated on the floor. You know, they had a mixed report out of committee, um, but then were voted down by the whole legislature. And some were just so out there that they were unanimously defeated in committee. Um, and that was really encouraging to see, too. All right, so let's talk about what's next. And this picture is from a rally around the Protect Maine Elections um, uh, legislation, you know, the foreign government spending one, which I thought was a good choice for what's next because that's, is this next question mark? We, <laughs> we may still be working on this, but the, whether we are or not, there's gonna be a lot we're gonna be working on. Um, so, um, so I'll just run through some of the issue areas that we definitely see ourselves working on um, now through, you know, I would say the start of ne the next legislative session. And this is also to say we would love for anyone on this call to get involved with any piece of this work, you know, whether you're able to, you know, join a meeting, join a team, or whether there's just a, you know, a piece of research or outreach or anything like that that you want to help out with get in touch with us, you know, we'll have our email addresses at the end, but you can contact us through the website as well. Um, any piece of this, anyone here is welcome to join, join on. Um, and there's a lot. Um, the first, 
you know, the question mark, are we going to have to rally for a veto override um, attempt next week? Um, that would be on be next Tuesday. And then after that, you know, supporting this when it moves to the ballot. Um, the league does not, you know, we never take stances in candidate races, but when there are democracy issues on the ballot, we often will, you know, will endorse on those. We endorse to restore same day registration. We endorse to, you know, strengthen the clean elections program in 2015. And this may be another one we will be um, endorsing if it goes there. Yep. Um, and then, so national popular vote. Um, you know, as I mentioned, the education and preparing for 2024 work continues. We have a list of every legislator and, you know, where we think they stand on it. Do we know where they stand? How do we get people to let those legislators hear that it's important? Because I had legislators at the beginning of this year's session telling me, like, you know, I'm hearing from constituents who oppose this. I'm hearing from constituents who support this. And we need them to be hearing from the constituents who support this and just to, like, wrap their heads around the issues. And it really does take a whole team to do this. Um, we had a really robust effort in 2021 that unfortunately, you know, we weren't able to get over the finish line because of mostly issues outside of our control. But um, I think the volunteers we have who work on this are some of the most passionate we have. And we think it's just such an important issue um, that we will definitely be working on that as the 24 session approaches. Um, so then the next area is our voting rights work. And, you know, as I mentioned, voting rights in Maine, they are in quite a strong place, but there's always more we can do. Some of the issues that we bring forward to the legislature and in our advocacy elsewhere are really founded on the research we do, you know, what actually increases turnout. To use an example with ongoing absentee, you know, we were I would say relative to a lot of, you know, voting rights organizations, we've been a little more cautious on vote by mail um, legislation. Tepid. Tepid. Call me tepid. <laughs> <laughs> you know, because there, the evidence has been limited, I would say, on its, you know, impact on voter turnout and then considering the context of Maine vote. We did more research, and I think with ongoing absentee in particular, we saw a strong case that it would help improve turnout, in, especially in low turnout elections. And that's something that really excites us because those are the ones where, you know, there's the most opportunity to grow. Um, so this year, between now and next le legislative session and onward, one thing we're trying to wrap our heads around is like, how does polling place closures, particularly in Maine, impact voter turnout? Um, we've seen efforts throughout the past several years to, you know, consolidate polling places. So Augusta was proposing to move from four polling places to one. And, you know, we spoke to some counselors and helped make sure that that didn't pass. But we see these efforts and I should, you know, I should be clear, I don't think they're rooted necessarily in voter suppression they're rooted in just like you know being easier to run saving some money but if that's having a con negative consequence on voter turnout then we want to be able to strongly stand up and say that's the case but we need to build you know build our depth of research on this for sure um do you want to talk about some of the money and politics work that we have uh, to do well over the next year and we've got a lot of conversations to have about this. You know, will the clean elections funding be sufficient? Um, what do we have to do to make sure it's sufficient? What do we have to do to make the gubernatorial gubernatorial program more robust? You know, we passed our clean elections law at the same time that Arizona passed theirs. And uh, they had a governor elected with clean elections the first election out of the gate. We have never had a governor elected that ran with clean elections. And, um, you know, that's a question I think we have to look pretty hard at. So we've got some work to do on the clean elections front and county clean elections is, is a part of that. And then we've got these difficult questions to deal with corporate contributions and, um, and true source disclosure. So we've got, you know, some work cut out for us in order to really make the case that those are meaningful reforms that won't have too many adverse consequences. Absolutely. Um, we're also continuing work, whoops, um, we're continuing work to expand um, local ranked choice voting. So folks may remember we pass, helped pass um, ranked choice voting for local elections in Westbrook a couple of years ago, um, building on Portland, um, passing it and expanding its use. Um, we're looking to see if there's other 
communities that might be a good fit for ranked choice voting. And so there's work in both, you know, building that sort of community movement and then also understanding, you know, on the technical side, what does it take to bring ranked choice voting to more communities in Maine? So that's an area of work I'm really excited about. Um, and then our most our newest um, policy team in the advocacy committee, the racial justice and equity subcommittee. Um, the you know biggest piece I think is definitely the tribal sovereignty work for 2024. Um, I'll just highlight a couple of other pieces that that committee has worked on. Um, there was a bill to increase legislator pay, and folks may know legislator pay in Maine is quite paltry. Like. It makes it very hard for working people to, to serve people who, you know, aren't self-employed or retired in particular. And so we supported an increase in that pay. And one actually did get funded this year. And it's not final yet, but, you know, it may be a step forward. Um, and so we've been doing some research and drafting some testimony, you know, to help support that. And we'll see how that issue continues to develop over time. And then, you know, finally, the... Um, prison gerrymandering legislation was also in this subcommittee. And it's been a really great place to sort of, you know, I think explore these issues and think about what additional issues that sort of go beyond what we typically weigh in on, but are supported by our positions that we can get involved in. You know, we testified against a bill to ban um, critical race theory. It was a particularly poorly drafted bill, I would say, but it was one that, you know, there weren't our voice, we were told our voice would be helpful on this. And um, we we spoke up on it and it was defeated and it was a really great opportunity in that team to figure out how to how to express that. Um, and then, yeah, finally, how, you know, how to get involved. Um, these subcommittees meet fairly regularly, a little less often during the summer, but um, our meetings are open to anyone who's interested in attending. So feel free to just message either of us if you're interested in attending one. Um, there's research tasks, as I mentioned, outreach, putting together educational programming that can be done whether or not you're able to attend meetings regularly. Um, and so we would, you know, really encourage if any of this is speaking to you to get involved with that. Um, and then, you know, taking action. If we do have a veto, which I'm checking my phone every five minutes to see if it <laughs> happens and still no word. If there is one, you will definitely be hearing from us um, very soon on what the next action steps are there. If there's anything else that comes up in this last week of the session, you know, you will hear from us too on the on our mailing list. Um, I suspect you all are on it already. And I think you, yeah, I suspect that's the case. But if not, go to our website and sign up. Um, it's really just I, such a great way to stay in the loop on everything that's happening here. And I just want to say, if you love public policy, if you're interested in public policy, if you believe in evidence-based policy, volunteering on these committees is so interesting and so much fun. And, um, you know, most of the work you can do whenever you want. There are meetings, but they're all on Zoom, so you don't have to really go to Augusta or travel. Um, there, There's room for everybody to do something. You know, we need people to just run spreadsheets. And if you have a knack for um, Google Sheets, if we <laughs> really need somebody who knows how to run Google Sheets. So there, there's a lot of roles to play. And our strength is so much multiplied by the fact that we're a combination of staff and volunteers. And we really would welcome anybody who's interested to join the work and um, get, get engaged in it. Absolutely. Well, I think that brings us to the end of what we had here. Um, I put our emails up here again in case um, you have any questions or you want to get involved in any way. Um, I'll pause a minute here for questions before we uh, call it an evening. But um, again, I just want to thank you all so much for taking the time today. If you've taken any sort of actions for us over this legislative session, thank you so much. It has made, made a difference, um, I think, you know, when I talk to legislators, they know what issues are important to us. And it's because folks are across the state are letting them know that it's important and um, it makes such a big difference. All right.
Well, I don't see any questions coming in, but if you have anything that comes to you, um, feel free again to get in touch. Um, and we will certainly be in touch soon. I'm sure we'll, you know, the legislative session's over, but I'm sure we will have plenty of programming to come. Look for some educational programming on both what is going to be on the November ballot, because it could be a lot. And then also about some of the work coming up for next year. Look for that over the coming months. Um, and until then, uh, no thank veto you all so yet. Much. No veto yet. <laughs> See you As later. Of right now. <laughs> right. Bye. <laughs> bye. Here, let's uh -huh. see. And webinar.